Valley Church. Hope for those who have given up on church. Hi, folks, and welcome to the Freedom Valley Show. Thank you so much for watching. We're in a series we're calling Passion right now. We're talking about becoming people of uh, energy and passion about the things of God. And I, I'm so glad that you're joining us for this. Love to hear from you during this. If you'd like to write me, you could write jerry at freedomvalley.org or you can write the church, Freedom Valley Church, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. Thanks so much for watching. And if you write, thanks for writing. God bless you. All right, folks, welcome back. And thanks for joining me. We're in the second week of our Passion Series where we're talking about being a people of zeal. There is a scripture in Romans 12, 11 that says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And let's talk about being a people of enthusiasm and, uh, and, and being somebody who cares deeply about what we're about here. We are about the kingdom of God and about everything about God. That's our purpose and our focus and uh, what we're going to be about today. We're going to be in Psalm 78 today as we consider one of the ancient hymns of the church, Psalm 78. And I want you to join me there while you're finding that on your device or in your Bible or whatever. I got a joke or two for you, something funny to start with. A child asked his father, how were people born? So his father said, well, Adam and Eve made babies, and then their babies became adults and made babies and so on. The child then went to his mother and asked his mother the same question. How were people born? And she told him, we were monkeys. Uh, we evolved to become like we are now. The child ran back to his father and said, you lied to me. And his father said, no, 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 son, you don't understand. Your son was talking about her side of the family. So there you go. A little bit of humor for today. Hopefully you can take that humorously. That's the point of it. I have one more. I said maybe a couple of jokes. I have one more. I found a frustrated blonde staring at her calculator. When somebody asked her what was wrong, she said, I need to add 10 plus 6, but I can't find the 10 button. So there you go. There's our humor for the day. And I enjoyed that very much. Psalm 78 is a, a hymn of the church written probably more than 5,000 years ago. And it is talking about probably Deuteronomy 6, where the children of Israel are instructed to train their children. And I want you to notice this. We've called this Pay It Forward because it is about, it, it is about uh, investing ourselves in the next generation and Psalm 78 says it so well. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we've heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful refusing to give their hearts to God. I love this passage for so many reasons. I love that it was written as a hymn to the churches. Uh, of course, music is one of our powerful teaching methods. It's one of the ways we transmit to each other what really matters in life. When we sing about love and we're, we're getting toward the uh, whole Valentine's event and everybody's singing about love, one of the greatest emotions a human can experience is to love another person and uh, we reinforce these ideas and concepts and what works and what is valuable to us. We teach each other with our songs. And here's a song. This is an ancient song, a hymn that uh, Asaph was told to teach to the congregation. The, the keeper of the choir was told to teach to the congregation and uh, to give them insight about who God was and what he was like. What he says in this psalm is huge. It's powerful to us as he uh, sort of gives us some instruction and some ideas about, about transmitting our faith. Because we want to be people who not only live our faith well, but people who transmit it to our children. Now, our world is full of craziness about this idea 
about how things get transmitted and how they're taught to the next generation. But I can tell you this, uh, parents, nothing is as important or as valuable as your words to your own children. You having something to say to them. And I want you to notice verses 4 and 5. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. Now, what, uh, what the, the song is trying to teach us here is the importance of being somebody who teaches our children what we really believe. You know, I am disturbed as a pastor of uh, how many funerals I do with children who are not really aware of what their parents believe. Very often, come to that final step with their parents and they're more about the confusion of their parents' heart. They will say, my parents never openly confessed Christ as their Savior. My parents never told me that they believed in anything. They sort of lived it. We sort of see it, but they never said it. You know, the Bible teaches us here, we ought to be people who teach our children, people who openly talk to our children about what we believe and where we have opportunities to help them to get in their hearts and minds the truth of the Word of God so they can live it too. Uh, we we want to be people who teach them, and we teach them as openly as we possibly can. Uh, we need to take time to make sure they hear instruction from us. You know, our world has, we've gotten to where we farm out education to the public school or, the, or whatever school. We uh, give up a lot in that process. But we sort of expect that somebody else should take care of our kids. We farm out health insurance. We farm out uh, health care for ourselves and our kids. Not as involved as we ought to be. We ought to be people who are involved in these things. We know what's going on. And we have made sure that our children hear from us themselves. Now, that doesn't guarantee that a child will not ever wobble in their pursuit of those things. I believe a healthy child will wobble. They will try to figure out for themselves what they really believe. But we need to do our part. And our part is to teach them. Make sure they know. Make sure they hear from us and have some insight from us about what we really deeply believe. You know, uh, parents, I would beg you, before you step over into the next life, pass on to your children something they can get a hold of. Let them get a hold of your faith. Let them get a hold of what really matters. Because can I tell you, as somebody who does many, many funerals, I, I watch people at that moment as they um, uh, celebrate what their parents were. And many times that's when they're ready to make a decision. Many times in the celebration of what their parents really were and what really mattered to them, that's when they decide. And I, I want to encourage you to be somebody who speaks to your children, who puts it in writing, puts it in words, puts it in, in everyday language. You have so many ways of teaching to your children the things that really matter and that your faith in God is a huge part of that. Make it huge in your life. Uh, children learn this in a lot of ways. In fact, in Deuteronomy 6, it says, Repeat it again and again to your children. This is verse 7 of Deuteronomy 6. Talk about it when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. This is just Moses saying, hey, listen, use every kind of trick or understanding you can think of for your kids to try to get something about your heart into their spirit forever. Uh, he says, uh, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The last thing he says, let me just take these in reverse order. He's talking about creating things that kids will see on an uh, probably on an almost accidental level as they go through life a little bored with a little bit uh, with their minds a little bit out of control and their mind out of control instead of their eyes landing on the f-bomb and all the stuff that people say we'll find something 
to enhance their spirits about who God really is, something to get deep inside of them. You know, I remember my, my mother had mottos all over the house, and uh, my, my father had a, a sign on his desk about trusting God, and um, uh, there was everywhere decorations in our home, on the doorposts, as he said, and on our gates. It was carved, it was written, it was somehow put in a place where we would see it a lot. And my parents weren't just trying to teach us, they were also trying to teach themselves. Because in your spirit, you, you will quickly lose what is in, the, in front of you a lot. We need it to be in front of us a lot. We need to be around us a lot. Uh, he says, tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads. You know, you can put whatever you want on that tattoo on your skin. You can put whatever you want on that, uh, on that place that you display for everybody to look at, whatever part of your features or face or hands or whatever that is. Make it something that is a billboard for God. Make it something that God can use and get them everywhere. And he says, talk about them. He says, talk about them when you're on the road. Talk about them when you're lying down. Talk about them when you're getting up. Think about the things of God and find a way to get them on your lips so that your children actually hear you saying in words things that matter to your heart and that have uh, importance to you. And they hear it in so many different ways. Uh, I'll just give you a, a quick example. I remember when my mother walked through the front door of our house and emblazoned on my mind. She had been with my older brother in, who was in a farm accident, had been with him in the hospital for a few days, hadn't been home at all. We couldn't wait to see my mother again. We wanted to know how my brother Glenn was doing. In those days, it, there wasn't cell phones and everybody didn't have the instant communication. We wanted to know. And she walked through the door. We ran to the door. We crowded around her and just said, what's going on with Glenn? How's he doing? And my mother started recounting. I heard her and I saw her start recounting some negative things that were going on in his life. She said his bones are badly broken and he is in a lot of pain and, and uh, the agony is beyond control. And, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden I saw her also catch herself. And as she caught herself, she sort of set her mind on Jesus and on God. And she said, but I believe that our God is going to see him through. You know, our God did see my brother through. And our God also taught me huge lessons at that point. My mother was teaching me with her life where her mind went. You know, she said years later, she said, you are who you are when the world around you is shaking. Where do you go at a time like that? I remember her saying that. I remember my father saying, man, I want to go to the Lord. I want to go to God when my world is shaking. You know, when somebody close to you passes, you, you feel like your world is trembling because you hung on to them. They gave you stability. I felt that with, when my parents passed on. I felt my world tremble. And, but I also heard my mother's words who said, where do you go? Who are you really? And I cast my care on the Lord at that point. I put my heart in God there. And I want my children to get that. I want them to see that. I want them to feel that with me and to experience that. And I want to make sure they get the reasons and the purposes, everything down to the nuances of how my mind thinks so that they too can grab a hold of that and they have some place to go. You know, some, sometimes our children only have memories of our doubt flooding out, memories of our issues pounding them, of our own, uh, our own issues in church with who likes who and whether or not somebody took my seat and who frustrated me at the casserole and, you know, all this stuff. So many things, but they've never heard us once talk about our faith in God or on our unmovable, unshakable belief that God will come through. And, and he's just saying, hey guys, make sure that you take time to give your kids instruction. He says, when you're lying down, make sure you have an opportunity there. You know, I, I know people that have prayer with their kids every night before bed. That's teaching them. I, I know kids that, I know uh, people that say that uh, every time they go to bed, they talk about their day with their children. That's an opportunity to teach them. You talk about them when you're 
when you're uh, lying down and when you're rising up. You talk about them everywhere you go so that your children have an opportunity to hear God from you. Repeat them again and again, he's saying. Be somebody who's con- who constantly has in your mind the issues that you really want to get across because what you really want to get across, you will. And if your mind is empty and if your mind is unchosen about who your faith is in, your mind will be full of cluttered issues that will come out and your children will struggle with clutter. Just a, a world that doesn't, a, a mind that doesn't know what to believe or how to believe it or where to go in difficult times. Uh, carefully, he's saying here, carefully outfit your house with God's words and watch what God will do. And it doesn't have to be, these don't all have to be quotations of scripture. This could be you outfitting your house with uh, a, a great way that somebody else put it into words or a, a quote that you read or something powerful that, that means something to you from all over that also is reflected in the word of God. It doesn't need to be just scripture quotes, though it certainly could be, but a few well-placed words make all the difference to your children. Then he says in verse 7, so each generation should set its hope anew on God not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. He's saying here, give your kids their own hope. You know what? Uh, Our kids, while we're alive, while we're around, our kids will come rushing to us when they need things. And that's as it should be. Uh, Children should go to their parents when when they're in need. Uh, We get to minister to them and be there for them. But there comes a time when we need to teach them how to go get it themselves. They need to know how to access the throne room of God themselves and have it come out of them and and even be there for us in many ways. And he says, each generation should set its hope anew on God. Where do your children go for their hope? Are are they about the hope of God that flows from you? Now, uh, I don't want to say this is something that happens at every moment because every child will struggle. Every child will struggle. When every child self-actualizes their faith, they struggle with it. It's something that is difficult and challenging and, and uh, uh, requires a lot of thought for a child to go through. But overall and in time, you know, there's a great scripture that says, uh, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It's saying over time and over the process of life, a child will learn. And what we need to do is be, be there to give them their own hope in the Lord, to challenge them to turn to God so that when we have conversation with them, when we have an opportunity to sow into them the word of God, we're giving them a reason to hope and a way to hope. I remember my father, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm, and my father uh, was always about the job. We had to got to get the hay in before the rain, and we got to we got to get the wheat in on time, and we got to feed the cows. And you know he was about the job. But my dad also, I man, looking back, I remember so many times when he would pause in the middle of his busy day with so many to do items. You know, I, I read somewhere that a farmer is a lot like a pastor. At the end of the day, you can't say you did everything on the farm that can be done. There's still more to do. I don't know about that analogy, but I think it's funny and interesting. And my, my father always had things to do. There was always things on his plate. But I do remember him taking time. Uh, in the midst of fixing the, the hay bine or the baler or, or uh, working on the... on. Uh, I remember one time in the middle of the night, we got up and we chased cows. Uh, cows had gotten out and a neighbor stopped by to say, your cows are all over my cornfield or something. I don't know. And we were chasing cows. My dad came screaming into our bedroom, get up, we got to go get the cows. And we all ran outside and uh, half asleep were flailing around trying to chase cows back. And we finally got them. Uh, I also remember that my father uh, took some time to appreciate us and thank us for that. And uh, and uh, uh, t- talk about how God takes care of his animals at that point. My father took time out of a busy schedule, out of so much to do, and found the time to train us. I remember that my dad every Sunday morning had uh, Bible lessons for us. And uh, we mocked him for that. We made fun of him. We got on his case about those. We tried to change them. My father just steadily stayed with it all the time, staying with it. Every day, uh, time to pray with us and time to 
uh, teach us the word. He was giving us a reason for our own hope. Uh, can I tell you that my father had 11 children, and as far as I know, all 11 of them confessed faith in Christ. All 11. That's pretty major. And, and uh, I don't know, I wonder how many families with more than four kids have most of them living for God. But my father did, and he took time out of his busyness to give us our own hope. I love that. I appreciate that so much. Looking back, I, I remember the times when we were so busy. Uh, of course, we kids didn't see ourselves so busy, but my father was always so busy. There were so many things to do. But he took time to teach us and to train us and to help us understand. My father took us to funerals for that reason. You know, I uh, see the um, challenge, the mm, temptation today for us to keep our kids out of funerals, away from funerals. Man, I thank God that my father didn't. At 16 years old, when my good friend Aaron was killed in, a, in an auto accident, my parents urged me to go to that. Aaron did not live for God. His family was not confessing Christ as their Lord and Savior, as far as I know. But they wanted me to go so I could experience the other side and see what it was like to be without hope. To be totally hopeless. I love that about my parents. They were always wanting to find, to use every life experience as a teaching opportunity so that I would have my own hope and so that I would teach my own children. He, he goes on here to say, uh, each generation, each generation should set its own hope anew on the Lord. Each generation should be one that says, I want to have my faith deeply rooted in God and who he is. I want to obey all of his commands. And not forget his glorious miracles. Let me just talk about the glorious miracles for a minute. When he's saying each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands, I wonder how many of you, of your children, know the miracles you lived through. Can I tell you, last summer, when I went through my own miracle, and, and uh, I had this ex experience where I had um, uh, the hematoma and my bleeding in my brain and had, had the motorcycle accident and uh, supposedly died on my way to the hospital and all that stuff. Had so many of you praying for me, uh, which I appreciate so much. But can I tell you that my children renewed their relationship with God because of that moment in my life, which I count so precious. Then I started hearing stories, and the stories I heard from all of you. So many of you have had some kind of a hematoma uh, bleeding in your brain where something wasn't working for a while, or have had a, a, some kind of a horrible experience that God bailed you out of, and you know he did, but your children don't know. They never heard the story. They never heard you talk about it. I remember my father, at something in his early 40s, uh, had, a, had a farm accident where a, a, a grain elevator fell on him and it messed up his back. And he was in serious shape for a while. We wondered if we'd have to sell the farm and all that stuff. And a long time it took for him to heal from that. But I remember him stating his faith in the Lord and believing that God was going to heal him and bring him through, and God did. And then he talked about it for years. He talked about how God brought him through that and God rescued him out of that and God gave him life and future and hope. Uh, he's, saying, he's just saying, give each generation their own hope. Uh, teach with every interaction that they will have their own hope. Pass on your values and truths and thoughts and ideas. Put it into your words. The best words you got. If, if you're not very good with words, use bad ones. Use, <laughs> use poor words, I'm saying. The best understanding that you can to make sure that your children get your faith and have time for, for themselves to understand. Here at our church, we have something we call app groups, which is uh, one of my fellow pastors teaches in a video session that you can use and you can download. And I noticed that both of those guys uh, use them also as family devotionals for their own family. They watch the app group, and they take time for the children to hear them declare the Word of God and then, and then uh, offer questions for it. You could be part of that. That would be a great experience for you to grow and 
and learn the Lord. And for you just to be there to say, let's turn this on, let's watch this, let's make this important to us, would be a great way for you to get started in this. Uh, there, there are so many examples that you could give of how to do this and how to work with it. Then it says in verse 8, Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. I want you to notice this. Can I tell you that as a pastor, I hear a lot of people who have a weird level of reverence for their parents. And what I'm talking about is they have this so high respect for their parents that even when their parent has told them a thing that is proven wrong, they choose to believe it. I had somebody tell me after a service, man, I hear what you're saying, but my father always taught me something different and I'm going with my father. Really? Seriously? We're going to be people who choose to listen to our parents? Here, here's my point. The Bible teaches us to respect and honor our parents. But here it's teaching us that we need to teach our children not to be like their forebears who were stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful. In other words, we need to teach our children that they need to have a brain of their own, that they need to go after God for themselves, and that they could outdo us. i got to tell you, this is my favorite thing about my parents. My parents taught me passionately again and again that we should go after the Word of God more than we go after anything they ever taught us. You know, as I look back, I think I took that far more seriously even than they intended. They didn't know what that truth meant. But I remember challenging their thoughts on the Word of God and many times uh, uh, saying, but wait a minute, the Bible doesn't quite say this. And how is this all working? And asking uh, honest and bold questions about it. Here's the point. The Word of God wants us to help our children to get more of God than we got. And if we're doing a good job of parenting, we love our children so much that we would like them to go further than we went. We'd like them to have more than we got. And we need to teach our kids that there are things about us that are honorable and godly and things that are not so much. And that's the truth. All of us. None of us are so great at this thing that we're perfect and we have everything together. Our children need to examine the Word of God and go after God, not after us. So that they learn from us one thing above everything else. Go after God no matter what. More than you go after us, more than you go after anything we've taught you. You know what I love about my parents? that uh, They found a way to get happy about my leaving the Amish, as hard as that was. My father told me once, if I was your age, I'd probably do it too. That was so hard for me to take, but that's what he said. And he said that because he wanted me to become a God chaser more than a, a person who chased his dad. I love that. And I tell you, I, I hear a lot of families who, who believe that being tight as a family means that we have to be loyal to each other and we gotta, we got to teach the teachings of our parents and we we got to do exactly what our parents did. When actually, our parents maybe should have taught us that, you know what, we come from generations of people that aren't so good with serving God. And sometimes our, us and our parents were stubborn and rebellious and unfaithful. You go with God further than we went, further every time. You go on. You get more of who God is than what I could ever give you. You will do so well if you do that. The glory of the Lord will be on you in a greater way than it was on us if you will follow God with your whole heart. Thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate you uh, watching Passion the second week with me. God bless you. Thanks, folks, for watching, for being a part of this. I appreciate that so much. Again, I'd love to hear from you. You could write the church at Freedom Valley Church, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. Or you can write me on my email address, jerry at freedomvalley.org. Either way works fine. Thank you so much for being a part of this and for watching our show today on passion. God bless you.